Mine and Charlie's are too. But that's the ex ex exceptional. I mean, a divorce is actually comparatively rare among standard New York social types. Contrary to what people might think. Well, usually there's something wrong, though. Dead fathers are a common problem. Jane's father's dead, very suddenly, last year. Must have been awful for her. Yes. It was tough on him, too. That's different, though. That, that doesn't mean a broken home. Well, it still means having your mother go out on dates. My, my point was that the common image of divorce and, and decadent behavior being, being prevalent among New York social types is not really accurate. That's more Southampton. What a mystery. Rick Von Sloniker and Serena Slocum still together. Seems like months. It has been months. Well, one thing's for certain. She's lost her virginity by now. How can you say that? You're right. Maybe she wasn't a virgin. <laughs> Riffra. He's hardly that. Oh, you mean because of his title? We're supposed to be impressed by that. On the contrary, I think the titled aristocracy are the scum of the earth. I remember a long letter you wrote, Serena, about agrarian socialism. I think it was one of the first things to set Alice Dreyer off about Marxism. Since then, she's joined the Red Underground Army. If she blows herself up, it'll be your fault. It's actually surprising to see you at something like this. In your letters, you expressed a vehement opposition to dead parties and to conventional society in general. I take it you've changed your mind. No, I'm just as much opposed as I've ever been. Then what made you decide to come tonight? He got an invitation. He's right. I got an invitation and didn't particularly have anything else to do. I think that's the case with almost everybody. No, Nick goes whether he's invited or not. Unlike Tom, I'm in favor of these kind of parties, and I want to show that support however I can. I don't know. It's a bit ridiculous for someone to say that they're morally opposed to dev parties and then attend them anyways. It's, it's untenable. Everyone does. But that's no contradiction. I wasn't trying to. Well, I think it's justifiable to go once to know at first hand what it is you oppose. I'd read Veblen, but it was amazing to see that these things still go on. You're a Marxist? No, I'm a committed socialist, but not a Marxist. I favor the socialist model developed by the 19th century French social critic Fourier. You're a Fourierist? Yes. Um, Fourierism was tried in the 19th century and, and failed. I mean, wasn't Brook Farm Fourierist? It failed. That's debatable. It, whether Brook Farm failed? That it ceased to exist, I'll grant you, but whether it was really a failure, I don't think can be definitively said. Well, well for me, ceasing to exist is, is failure. I mean, that's... That's pretty definitive. Well, everyone ceases to exist. That doesn't mean everyone's a failure. All this is is pretty deceptive. All what? Well, I, I think that, that, that we are all, in a sense, doomed. What are you talking about? Downward social mobility. I've, we hear a lot about the great social mobility in America with the focus usually on, on the comparative ease of moving upwards. What's less discussed is how easy it is to, to go down. And I think that's the, the direction that we're all heading in. And, and I think that the downward fall is going to be very fast. Not, not just for us as, as individuals, but the whole preppy class. Where do you get all this? Well, just look around. I mean, take those of our fathers who grew up very well off. I mean, maybe their, their career started out well enough, but, but just as their contemporaries really began to accomplish things, they, they started to quit. I, I'm rising above office politics. Or, or refusing to compete and risk open failure, or, or not, not doing the humdrum part of the job, or only doing the humdrum part, or gradually spending more and more time on something more interesting, um, the conservation or the arts, where even if they were total failures, no one would know it. Okay. I guess we all know who you're talking about. I can't deny your point, but unlike you, I've always assumed I'd be a failure anyway. That's why I plan to marry an extremely rich woman. Guy. Why is he so successful with girls, then? Rick Von Sloniker is tall, rich, good-looking, stupid, dishonest, conceited, a bully, liar, drunk, and thief, an egomaniac, and probably psychotic. In short, highly attractive to women. You're completely unfair. You don't know anything about Rick. In fact, he's quite shy. God! He's a considerate and sensitive man. The rest is just a superficial game he plays, a facade you've obviously been taken in by it. It's incredible the eagerness of girls like you to justify the worst bastards imaginable as being sensitive and shy. But if any guy who really was shy dared talk to you, you wouldn't give him the time of day your eyes would glaze over. You're really hung up on Rick, aren't you? He must really threaten you somehow. <laughs> You're right. I do feel threatened. 
Then I may get a venereal disease from one of the St. Tim's girls he's been with. <gasps> oh. Did you learn that from your lovemaking with Rick? I hear it can get really rough. Hey! God. Don't do that again. For me, it isn't erotic. I read that Lionel Trilling essay you mentioned. You really like Trilling? Yes. I think he's very strange. He says that nobody could like the heroine of Mansfield Park. I like her. Then he goes on and on about how we modern people of today with our modern attitudes bitterly resent Mansfield Park because its heroine is virtuous. What's wrong with a novel having a virtuous heroine? His point is that the novel's premise, that there's something immoral in a group of young people putting on a play, is simply absurd. You found Fanny Price unlikable? She sounds pretty unbearable, but I haven't read the book. What? You don't have to have read a book to have an opinion on it. I haven't read the Bible either. What Jane Austen novels have you read? None. I don't read novels. I prefer good literary criticism. That way you get both the novelist's idea as well as the critic's thinking. With fiction, I can never forget that none of it ever really happened, that it's all just made up by the author. Yes, Rick and Serena broke up. This afternoon, they both went down to Washington for Holly Gilchrist's party. It was Holly who was responsible for getting them together in the first place. Oh, so she was responsible. They went together? They went separately. How they'll come back. I think that Rick is the sort of guy that lets himself be dropped. Ha! What is that supposed to be? Ha! Rick really threatens you somehow. How does he threaten me? Maybe by being more of a man than you are. Oh, stupid slut. What has Rick done that's so terrible? He is terrible. I shouldn't have to go into all the sordid details. Well, could you go into a few sordid details? I don't think there are any reasons except for maybe jealousy. Rick makes him feel terribly inadequate somehow. Okay. I'll tell you about Rick von Sloniker. Does the name Polly Perkins mean anything to you? Sounds familiar. She grew up in Virginia. A horse fanatic since childhood. Went to one of those horsey girls' schools, uh, Garrison Forest, I think. Sometime in her senior year, she started feeling depressed. Now, partly it was finally becoming disillusioned with horses, but there were some real psychological problems, too. That summer, she got a job in Edgartown and seemed completely recovered. Except for a couple of idiosyncrasies. She'd only dress in blue, and she wouldn't eat hamburgers unless they were completely well done. Any hint of redness, and she'd send them back. Out of loyalty, to her boyfriend in Virginia. She'd only go on group dates, never individual ones. Von Sloniker met her when he came to Edgartown for the regatta. She showed no interest in him at all initially, which makes sense because he's a completely uninteresting guy. But for someone like Von Sloniker, that's just inciting. So he swung into action with a full rigmarole about how desperately in love he was with her. How she was the first girl that ever made him feel that way. That was their obligation to themselves, to do everything they could to live life to the fullest. Polly had meanwhile quit her summer job and joined his boat for the rest of the cruise. And he now completely ignored her. She, in turn, became obsessed with him. Polly was a bit of a masochist and prone to drink too much. Von Sloniker exploited this to get her drunk and had her... Do you know what pulling a train means? I don't think so. When von Sloniker had gotten her blind drunk one night, he talked her into pulling a train. Him, Victor Lemley, the other crew member. When she arrived at Wheaton for her first semester, she was acting very strangely. Always wearing the same clothes. Never washing, except just putting on more and more makeup and perfume. She'd remain silent for hours and then talk obsessively about Paul McCartney. After two weeks, she was sent to McLean's for treatment, but was able to go home to Virginia for Thanksgiving. The day after Thanksgiving, she went into their stables and killed herself. I've heard about that girl, and it wasn't Rick's fault. She was just some girl who had a crush on him, but whom he hardly knew. She'd always had psychological problems and was, in fact, a pathological liar. It was very sad what happened, but Rick had absolutely nothing to do with it. I don't know. She was carrying his photo when she killed herself. That doesn't mean anything. 